Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm going to be your tour guide on Free Tours by Foot East End Food Tasting Tour. I'm a historian, and I'm passionate about the history, heritage, and culture of food, especially in London's East End, which is famous for many different waves of immigration. The East End is a fascinating place to explore, and it's an even better place to eat. I think that tasting history is the best way to learn about it, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be making a bunch of different stops, exploring the history of London's East End through different flavors, brought here by very diverse different groups of people. We're going to taste some things that ha people have been eating in London's East End since before the Romans were here, thousands of years of history. We're also going to taste some more recent favorites brought here by immigration, and we're going to taste a British classic that has a surprising Jewish history. Now, on our walk today, I'm going to be pointing out some of my favorite places to eat and drink. We're going to stop at a number of different places and walk through what I think is the most fascinating part of London. By the way, if you like this tour, you can always feel free to leave me a tip on my PayPal link below. It's jessicatourguide at gmail.com on PayPal, and there's a link below. Now, our first stop is right away. Let's jump right into it. We're going to go somewhere with a very perfect name for our tour, the English restaurant, serving up English food. Now, what is English food, you might, want, you might question? Well, London's food has long been inspired by the sea, which is quite close, and of course, the Thames River. And we're going to taste things from both of those areas today. But let's cross over. We're going to go into the English restaurant, and we are going to sample something that people have been eating for thousands of years in this area. place called the English restaurant, of course you're going to have to have a beer with your food. This is an IPA, that stands for India Pale Ale. It's a really hoppy beer, which is kind of an acrid, bitter flavor that you really grow to like. Um, IPAs were originally developed by the English as they took the long sea journeys to India. They added even more hops to the beer in order to preserve it so it wouldn't spoil on that long sea journey. And turns out, it's kind of an addictive taste. Hops are also a big part of English um, paganism and witchcraft. And would you look at that? I happen to have a hop tattooed right there on my elbow. You could say I like IPA a little bit too much sometimes. Now what else do I have here? Per oh. This is Jaipur IPA, by the way, from Jaipur, named after Sydney, from Thornbridge Brewery, a great English brewery. Now what else do I have here at the English restaurant? I told you we were gonna eat something that people have been eating in London for the last thousands of years, oysters. When Romans came to London in 48 AD, Londinium they called it, they said that Londinium had the finest oysters in all of the Roman Empire. And they loved them so much that they would preserve them, put them in big barrels along with fish sauce, which was a popular Roman condiment, put them in big barrels and transport them, uh, and urns, and transport them all over the Roman Empire. Londinium's oysters, I think, uh, or British oysters, are really, really delicious. And these ones here today we have are called Malden Rock. You may have heard of Malden sea salt. It comes from a place on the English coast called, of course, Malden. And Maldens are, I think, about a two on the, um, on the size scale. I'm just gonna use my little oyster fork here just to remove the, the little joint, the, the foot that's holding it on there. I'm going to take some of this mignonette. This is a French, lots and lots of French influence on British food. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go, because French immigrants are a big part of the East End's history. And they brought this mignonette, which is a vinegar with shallots or shallots in my native accent. Just add a little bit of that to your oyster. And one, two, three, down the hatch. It's fresh. Hello filled with um, kind of all kinds of delicious flavors of the sea and a little bit of that tart hint from the red wine vinegar and the shallots, addictive. The 
East End is known for four main waves of immigration. If you come on one of my food tours, you're going to hear me talk about this. All the way back in 1685, tens of thousands of French Huguenots or Huguenots forced to leave Catholic France by uh, Louis XIV settling in London's East End because they were Protestant. Then, and many of them were silk weavers, founding a really robust silk weaving industry here. Then, in the 19th century, tens of thousands of Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews forced to flee Poland and Russia, settling in this area that had then become unfashionable for the French Huguenot, and the area became um, known as the Jewish Quarter. 1970s, after many of the Jewish residents of London, of the East End, had left, moving to other parts of the city, this area became known for Bangladeshi refugees, as tens of thousands of Bangladeshi people were fleeing the war between East and West Pakistan in the 1970s. This area became known as Bangladesh. And then, of course, the most recent wave of immigration, the hipsters. Yes, of course, in the late 90s into the early 2000s, the East End, in particular nearby Shoreditch and Brick Lane, became really cool. That's because all of the artists were here. In the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, this was a really cheap place for artists to live. And you know what they say, or what I say, first come the artists, then come the hipsters, then come the bankers. And as you can probably tell from looking around, that's exactly what's happened to this area. And it has positives and definite negatives. But one thing it now has is amazing food. Spitalfields Market is known for having all kinds of different straight food vendors, both in counter service like this and in all kinds of food trucks from around the world. So when we're talking about traditional East End food on the walking tour, I want you to remember that London is the whole world in one city. If you can eat food somewhere in the world, you can probably get it in London and you can probably get it actually in the East End. On our tour, we walk through this amazing market. We check it out, Spitalfields Market, named after a hospital, hospital fields, in the, 60, uh, in the 12th century, rather. And this area is an amazing place for shopping, for dining, for relaxing, having a beer or wine. And I really hope that you enjoy it as you come on my tour or the next time you visit London. All right, guys, now we're walking somewhere that I'm really excited to show you because there's not that many of these left. A pie and mash shop, S.R. Kelly and Sons. The family has owned this um, brand since 1915, and this shop opened up in 1934 by Samuel Kelly, serving what is an East Ender's favorite meal, and that is pie and mash. Now when we talk about pie and mash in London, we are talking about meat pies, not fruit pies, although they do sell some apple pie here. Uh, meat pie is dates back all the way to Roman times. Ancient Romans would create a thick, dense pastry, quite hard actually, and they would fill it with a stew and then it was really portable. Crack that open and you've got something to snack on later on. However, over the centuries, we started making the pastry fluffier and lighter, crisper, so that it, it more tender. So instead of being kind of a hard puck, it's a light and flaky, uh, delicious thing to eat part of the meal instead of a container for the meal. Pies, when you think about them, they're all over the world. People eat pastry wrapped food. Think of it, dumpling, calzone, manto, samosa, um, a empanada, pastilla, and here, in London, we have pie. Now, pie and mash shops, working class all over London, traditionally in Victorian times. Today, there's only a handful of them left. As tastes change, pie and mash isn't as popular. However, new pie and mash shops are opening up in other parts of the country where East Enders have traditionally moved, like Essex. Now today, at SR Kelly and Sons, we are gonna try a traditional mince meat Pie. Now, wait a second, did I just say mince pie? I'm not talking about the fruit pies that we eat at Christmas, which are made of minced sweet meats, dried fruits. If you say mince pie or mince meat pie, you're usually referring to a Christmas sweet. But today we're gonna try a mince beef pie. 
This is the same recipe that the Kelly's great, great grandma Matilda had, uh, created back in 1915. We're serving it up with some mash. Now, potatoes are pretty recent newcomer to Europe. They come here in the 17th century, 16th century brought by the Spanish from Peru. But mashed potato quickly became a popular meal, a popular side dish, and with paired with a pie, it's absolutely delicious. We're gonna top that all off with some gravy. So we got our traditional triumvirate pie, mash, and gravy. You might also notice here that SR Kelly's serves up some jelly deals, traditional East End dish. If you come on my food tour, you've got to try some jelly deals if you're brave. Okay. We're gonna head inside in just a minute and I'm gonna order up the pie and mash in a takeaway container. When we head inside, you're gonna see that this is a really traditional shop. It looks just the way that it would have done back in the 1930s and the prices are really good too, making this a popular thing to eat for all different kinds of people in London's East End. If you wanna have the most traditional British food, pie and mash, really. We've been eating it for the pie part at least for thousands of years. Can I please have pie mash and gravy? Pie mash and gravy. To take away. Take away, yeah? Yeah, take away. So of course you can get pie mash and gravy at a pub. You can try that out, but it's always gonna be better from a small shop like this, especially one that has as much history as SR Kelly's. Scooping up some of that good mash. All right. So I am about to try Matilda Kelly's 115, sorry, 1915 recipe for pie and mash. We've got a minced beef pie with, oh my gosh, don't, you're gonna have to cut with me struggling. Let me get a bite ready and then you can cut it. There was no knives. Okay, there. I'm gonna tuck into Matilda Kelly's recipe from 1915 for a minced beef pie with mash and a perfect gravy. It's really flavorful, really juicy. It doesn't taste like the pies that you get at a pub. Those are often a little bit more um, foodified. They've got exotic ingredients, but really when you're craving pie and mash, this is what you want. walking and eating and chatting a little bit throughout the East End already, but I wanted to give you a little bit more history about this area because I think it really helps to make sense of everything. The East End of London back in the 19th century was considered one of the worst parts of the entire country. After all, this is Jack the Ripper's Victorian London. Down small little laneways like this, these were incredibly overcrowded areas actually pretty filthy, not very nice place to live. The area was poor. It was cheap in the 19th century. And as a result, it was the only place that many immigrants and refugees could afford to live, particularly in the 1840s, when tens of thousands of Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews were forced to leave Pol uh, uh, Tsarist Poland and Russia to escape pogroms there and many of them came here to the east end of London. Now some settled permanently. London still has one of the world's largest Jewish populations, including the world's third largest Orthodox Jewish population. And many other people use London as kind of a, a waiting station before moving on to places like Montreal and New York. But here in London's East End, the Jewish history has had a long and lasting impact. Let's walk a few steps up the way here on Sandy's Row. Now, we've already tried the most classic British dish with the Jewish history, and that's fish and chips. We are gonna try another Jewish dish in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, I wanted to show you Sandy's Row Synagogue. This is actually the oldest synagogue in London. This is an 18th century building 
that was converted to become an Ashkenazi uh, synagogue in 1854. And to this, there were older synagogues, but this is the oldest one still in use. And local Ashkenazi Jews in London's East End saved up their pennies and contributed to have a place to worship. Now, I promise you, we are gonna taste another Jewish dish. Follow me this way. Walking through London's East End, as I've mentioned, we have all of these different waves of immigration throughout the area, and they all mix together and communicate and talk to one another and influence each other, going both forwards and backwards. And there's nothing quite like fish and chips when it comes to a dish that really embodies the history of cultural diversity, a melting pot, immigration and food. Now, what do I mean by that? Fish and chips is, some people think, oh, it's probably been eating all the way back to Roman times. After all, we're on an island, right? Wrong. Fish and chips is a dish that is born out of modern immigration and technology because you needed two things in order to have fish and chips. You needed the railway to bring the white fish from cold northern waters to London and you also needed the immigrants to come to London to bring these foods here. Now that's because the first fish and chip shop or as we call it a chippy was open in the 1860s by a man called Joseph Mullen on the Mile End Road in London's East End. See, he was a Russian Jew, but he loved Portuguese Jewish fish called pescado frito. Portuguese Jews would eat this fish on the Sabbath, Shabbat, so that they didn't have to cook on those days, which was forbidden. They would fry bacalao, dried codfish, in matzo batter the day before Sabbath. And then they would be in, they'd cook it in schmaltz or chicken fat. And then they would be able to have something delicious and crunchy left over to eat the next day. Joseph Mullen really liked this fish, but he didn't want to serve it cold. He wasn't an observant Jew. So he decided to serve it hot with a side of vegetables that had only recently come to Europe potatoes. Yes, potatoes are not native to Europe. In fact, they only come here in the 17th century when the Spanish brought them from Peru, where there's over 4,000 different species of native potato. When the potatoes uh, first came to Europe, many people thought that they were poisonous and didn't eat them for about the first century. But by the 18th and 19th centuries, fried potatoes po um, were becoming popular in places like Belgium and France. And so Joseph Mullen said, aha, I'm going to start serving my pescado frito with frites, fried potatoes. Perfect. Now we need a sauce. Hmm, what goes really nicely with them? How about tartar sauce? A French sauce based on a Turkish sauce that is po uh, was also popular in Russia at the time called tartar sauce. This is a mayonnaise-based sauce, really similar to a French remoulade. Mayonnaise is filled with capers, chives, gherkin, pickles, uh, onions, dill, sometimes tarragon, and really perfect on the fish and chips. And we also need a topping. Now, you know, lemon tastes pretty good on fish. We love lemon on fish now, but lemon in the 19th century in the East End of London, are you kidding me? The only thing that was plentiful and cheap was malt vinegar, which was a byproduct of the brewing industry. And we had tons of that in the East End. Perfect, you got your fish, you got your chips, your vinegar, and your tartar sauce. It became a wild hit. Now, a lot of people go to eat fish and chips when they go to the coast. But fish and chips is actually a London invention. It became really popular because of the high-speed railways coming from the first time from Scotland into London in the 1840s and bringing white fish. Joseph Mullins' fish and chip shop on the Mile End Road was incredibly popular and it was referred to in the newspapers at the time as fish fried in the Jewish style. And since then, it's become one of the most beloved and iconic British dishes served all over the country and yes, all over the world, especially in former common and Commonwealth countries. Now, if you're gonna have some fish and chips, it's really common for people to say, oh, I'll just head to the pub. Pubs don't have very good fish and chips. They have 
okay fish and chips. Mediocre. Do I still order them? Yes. After three pints of beer, are pub fish and chips pretty good? Sure. But if I want a proper, delicious, authentic fish and chips, I go to a chip shop or a chippy. There's no better chip shop in London, or I think in the world, than Poppy's. Here, Poppy's Fish and Chips named after Pop himself, Pat Newland. He's been working in the fish and chips industry since 1952, when he was 11 years old. He used to wrap um, new fish and chips for his local chip shop in Bow, where he's from. Bow is in East London as well. Fish and chips, of course, used to be wrapped in newspaper until we realized that consuming lead-based inks isn't exactly good for you. Now today, Poppies creates their own newspaper out of beetroot ink, so it's completely safe to eat. They've won the National Fish and Chip Awards loads of times, and they have also a, a member of, in good standing, of the British Federation of Fish Fryers. Of course there's such a thing, you knew there had to be. Now we're gonna go inside and we're gonna order one of my favorite things, which is a cod bite and some chips, and I'm gonna taste it so that you guys can see just how good it is. Again, this is on every single food tour that we do in the East End, and people absolutely love this stop. I do too. I'm really excited. I don't like to play favorites, but I have to admit that this is my favorite thing on the food tour. So what I've ordered here is two cod bites. This is like the little um, cutting off the side of a cod filet. Rather than put it to waste, it is used for these cod bites, which are extra crispy, covered in this amazing batter, and chips. Now remember, these are not fries. We have fries in the UK. They're skinny. They're like McDonald's fries. These are chips. They're fat and they're supposed to be a bit kind of soft inside, almost like a jacket potato, like a baked potato. I'm just gonna try one without any sauce. Amazing. Now, what I also have here is their homemade tartar sauce. That's why you have to come on the tour with me. If you end up going on um, getting a takeaway without the insider knowledge, you might end up with their Heinz takeaway tartar sauce. No way, ma'am. The homemade stuff is too good. So I'm just gonna dip one of these cod bites. By the way, this is already doused in tons and tons of vinegar. It's also really hot. I'm gonna dip it in the amazing tartar sauce here. People always ask me, tartar sauce on fish or chips? Both, honey. I'd put it on a full book if I could. It's just so delicious. I'm not having it up for the camera. I know it may look like that, but it truly is one of my favorite things to eat in London. I love fish and chips and from Poppy's, they are absolutely the best. Before we cut here, I wanted to show you one more thing. We got to see Poppy. This is Pat Newland, Poppy himself. We're going to say thank you for creating these amazing fish and chips. So if you're enjoying the tour so far, go ahead and hit the like button. It helps others discover the video. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, subscribe to our channel. We have walks along the Thames, through Westminster, Camden, all over London. Visit our website for more about our tours, our travel tips, and more. We also have virtual tours and channels that focus on DC, New Orleans, New York, and more. Look for free tours by foot wherever you travel. You can support your guide with virtual tips, links in the description, and let us know what else you want to see. Leave a comment below. Now, back to the tour. Okay, we're gonna continue walking up Brick Lane now, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Jewish immigration in this area in the 19th century. So between 1860s and the 1890s, as we talked about back at the synagogue, we had um, tens of thousands of Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews escaping pogroms in Poland and Russia. And they brought with them a lot of their food traditions. Now, when I talk about Jewish food, people often suspect that maybe we're gonna go and eat some um, falafel or hummus, but they're actually thinking about Israeli food when they think about those foods. Instead, we're gonna kind of have the kind of Jewish food that your old Polish granny is going to make at home and that is some food from 
the bagel shops here on Brick Lane. Now the first thing you notice behind me is that there are two bagel shops. There is the first and best bagel shop, actually here since 1855, and the Bagel Bake, much younger in 1971. Now, the first thing that people tend to notice, other than there being two of them, is that they are open 24 hours, which is really unusual in London. The other thing that they notice is the spelling of the word bagel, which in some of the signs is actually spelled differently from each other. That's because this is actually the traditional pronunciation of the word that we say as bagel or bagel, I've heard some people say. A bagel is a traditional round boiled bread that traditionally has a hole in the center. Here in London, you're going to notice that our bagels, they have been baked and they've risen a little bit more and they've been baked in a way that the hole is actually almost closed up. Sometimes people say, where's the hole? It's there. It's just often sealed shut in the baking process. Now, bagels are really hard to get in England, or bagels. Sure, you can find them at the Tesco, you can find them at uh, some shops, but usually you're just eating bread that's round. They haven't been boiled. In order for a bagel or bagel to have its signature chewy al dente texture, the bread has to be brushed with, boiled, brushed with lye, and then baked. And that's what gives it its proper texture. Now, in other places in the world that are famous for bagels, you have cities like New York and Montreal, and they have their own styles of bagels. But here in London, we have our Brick Lane bagels, and they are a little bit sweeter, a little bit puffier, and we serve them not always with lox and cream cheese, although you can get smoked salmon and cream cheese, but we put salt beef on top. So let's go have a look. <clears throat> You can see here, hot salt beef. What's salt beef? What's, how's it different from corned beef? Well, corn, to corn something means to salt it. So salt beef and corned beef are actually synonyms to one another. Salt beef is a brisket of beef, which is traditionally a very tough cut. In parts of America, barbecue culture, people cook it low and slow over coals, over barbecue, but uh, with a boiled brisket, you simmer it gently for six, eight hours with bay, peppercorn, onion, and salt. Now with smoked meat in Montreal or with um, corned beef in New York City, they also add some pickling spices. But here in London, it's just kept really simple. It gives it almost this bouncy ham-like texture, which works really, really well on top of the bagel. Then on top of that, we put some English mustard and that's hot. Now, not hot here, but hot in your nose, like wasabi. As my grandfather would say, it's like a shot of whiskey. It really, uh, really shocks you. First bite might be okay, second bite might be okay, but you never know when that hot yellow English mustard is going to creep up on you. And finally, you top that off with a gherkin. That's the British way of saying a cucumber pickle. Now, um, Polish pickles are traditionally sour and salty and maybe even garlicky. And those would have been the types of cucumber pickles that uh, the Jewish um, immigrants to London would have likely had with their salted beef and their bagels. But over time, for English taste, the gherkins here with our bagels are sweet. So when you get a combination of sweet, salty, sour, savory, umami, and that hot mustard, it's absolutely amazing. All of your taste buds are taken care of, and this is truly, it, it's deceptively simple. It's just a few ingredients, but it really is one of the most addictive bites that you're gonna have here in London. And they're famous all over the UK. People pull up to this shop, 24 hour shop, all hours of the day and night to get their bagel fix. And if you see a long queue, don't be afraid. It moves really fast, because these ladies, they mean business. The ladies who work at the Brick Lane Bagel Shop are legendary for efficiency, and you better be prepared. One other thing when you're here, especially if you're visiting from North America, they don't toast it. They don't have different flavors. They don't have flavored cream cheese. One type of bagel, one type of cream cheese, one type of, sa or one type of salt beef um, sandwich. That is simplicity at its finest, and you've got to try this. Uh, on the food tour, this is always one of people's favorite stops. So we're going to head inside right now and I'm going to get in the queue. Now 
Okay, so I've just come out of the bagel shop and here we got, have my salt beef bagel with mustard and gherkin. You can see a nice soft texture of the bread. The meat is incredibly tender, pulls apart almost, again, kind of like a bouncy texture like ham. That's the saltpeter. Mm, that's the saltpeter, which is a type of pickling salt, a type of nitrate that gives the beef its texture. And of course the sweet gherkin, which is like a bit of a refreshing flavor. Now let's go in for the bite here. There's no way to do this and look pretty, okay? So watch me unhinge my jaw like a snake. Mm. <laughs> As I mentioned, it all comes together. Sweet, salty, savory, sour, umami. Absolutely delicious. Let me record that again because I had stuff all over my teeth. Again, all of those flavors come together. Sweet, salty, sour, savory, umami. You get this perfect bite. You gotta try this. We're walking down Brick Lane. Brick Lane is one of London's most famous ethnic streets. It is often referred to as Bangla Town. And that's because of those waves of different immigration that I've been telling you about. Most recently, this area is famous for Bangladeshi immigration. It still has a really thriving and robust Bangladeshi community. Now, the area is really known as London's Curry Mile. People come from all over the UK, all over London, and yes, all over the world to eat curry here on Brick Lane. Now, what is curry? If you go to India and you ask for a curry, people are going to say, you want a leaf? Curry is, in the UK though, means a, a dish. It means an, a loosely Indian dish, often with some fusion British elements, and it is going to often refer to going out for an entire kind of curry meal. Now here on Brick Lane, this area is famous for its curry restaurants. And if you walk along here at night, you're gonna see all kinds of different people calling you, asking for you, hi, <laughs> asking you to come into their shop, to come in and eat, to buy curry, to buy food. And uh, it's a really fierce competition. Now what's the most famous British curry dish? Chicken tikka masala which was invented in, of course, Birmingham. Birmingham is where a Bangladeshi chef was catering to postal workers who were complaining that the curry was too spicy. And so they just, he decided to tone it down with tinned tomato soup, yes, you heard me correct, more cream and more butter. And boom, chicken tikka masala was born. It's loosely based on a Punjabi dish called butter chicken masala. And chicken tikka masala became so famous that people now eat it all over the world. And I used to live in India, and people eat chicken tikka masala back in India now too. And I'm sure it's gonna come back here with even more changes. That's true fusion. And we're not gonna have a chicken tikka masala right now because if we did, I'm sorry, the food tour would be over. I would have to go have a nap. It is a big meal. When you go out for a curry with your friends, like game over, you have to go and maybe you're gonna go out drinking or you're gonna need a nap. Instead, we're gonna go to a sweet shop. And as you just already saw me say hello to my friend here at Raj Mahal. Now sweets, we just gonna have some candies, some sweets? No, sweets is a um, kind of Indian, South Asian term for snack shop. And at Raj Mahal, you can get all kinds of different snacks that you would normally find being sold on the side of the road in cities as diverse as Dhaka, as um, Mumbai, and as Lahore. But in London, we tend to serve them up in shops. So let's look at first at some of the different sweets that are here. Hi! So we have all kinds of different samosas and kebabs here. Samosa is a South Asian pastry, really similar actually to an empanada or a pasty or a pie. And 
Um, it is a pastry filled with meat or vegetable curry. In, um, traditionally in India, it's usually vegetables, but in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, you'll also get them with meat. And there's a few different types of uh, samosas here at Raj Mahal. You have these big Bengali or Punjabi shingara, which are bigger, almost like a softball size. And you also have these triangular shapes. I'm, I'm afraid that I'm interrupting the cricket. And all kinds of nice kebab, uh, deep, almost like a deep fried burrito filled with meats or vegetable curries. What am I going to try today? I do like lamb kebab. Can I, yeah, can I get a uh, lamb kebab roll? You can see it inside there. Lamb filled with, mixed with coriander, cilantro, onions and spices. Mm. Okay, you have to come on this tour just so you can try this. It's that delicious. After tasting that delicious lamb kebab kati roll, I again love pointing out all the different architectural and built heritage ways that we can also see this history and immigrate, uh, influence of immigration. For instance, let's have a look at this building here. This is the Brick Lane Jama Masjid, one of the largest mosques in East London. However, look at the date on that sundial, 1743. That's because this building was not built to be a Muslim mosque. It was built to be the French Huguenot Church. Remember, they were Protestant and they were Calvinist, actually, and they liked very plain buildings. So they built a pretty plain looking building. However, the Huguenots left this area by the early 19th century, and this became the Brick Lane Synagogue in 1894. Then, 1979, this became the Brick Lane Jama Masjid, a mosque. Church, ma synagogue, mosque. Believe it or not, this is the only building in the world that has been all three. There are lots of other buildings out there that have been one of, uh, two of the three, but no other building that has been all three like this. And actually, it was a Huguenot church, a Methodist church, then a synagogue, and then a mosque, giving it even more layers of history. I think this is a fascinating building to come and check out when you're on the tour. great chocolate you probably don't necessarily think of London you might think of cities in Belgium of course even Germany the land of chocolate but East End of London is actually home to one of the best chocolate shops in Europe and this is Dark Sugars Dark Sugars was opened uh, about eight years ago now by Nianga and her business partner John or Paul the chocolate man these guys create absolutely fantastic chocolate using cocoa from West Africa. Now, West Africa produces 60% of the world's cocoa, but typically it tends to be used for cheaper chocolate brands like Nestle and Cadbury. When people think of artisanal gourmet cocoa, they tend to think of South American grown cocoa. But that's why Nianga, who's originally from Ghana, wanted to showcase the beautiful chocolate from her native country. Now she's a Londoner just like me, but she really has a deep connection to her home country. And she said, you know what? I know that Ghanaian cocoa can be every bit as delicious as every bit as gourmet as South American cocoa. She also wanted to promote, promote fair trade, bean to bar, fully ethical chocolate from Ghana. Because shockingly, a lot of Ghana and Nigeria's cocoa production is done with slave labor. And so she wanted to pay, make sure that uh, her cocoa pickers and cocoa producers, farmers were paid a fair wage. And so all of the work is done by collectives. This is completely fair trade, bean to bar chocolate. It's incredibly ethical, but none of that would matter if it wasn't delicious. And it absolutely is. Dark Sugar's chocolate has won multiple awards and they've actually got a couple of shops in London now, oh, a, a huge one in Greenwich. Now, you'll see a lot of these beautiful wooden carved bowls 
these used to be filled with chocolates before COVID. And sadly right now, they're just not on display, but you can still order all of them. You have a look at this map, have a look at this menu. This is all the different chocolates that you can order and you can sample and taste as well. And hopefully by the time you come on this food tour, we'll be able to graze and sample and pick and choose uh, all the chocolates that we want to. So dark sugars is absolutely a big pick. Um, it also satisfies that sweet tooth. One other thing lately, they've started making their own ice cream as well, so that's worth giving a try too. After walking through the East End and tasting all of these different foods, I have to say I'm feeling pretty stuffed. And that's usually the common consensus for anyone who comes on this tour. Afterwards, I always say that you need to either go to the pub or go back to where you're staying so you can have a nap. It really is a big amount of food, tasting different amazing things from all over the world. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you lived vicariously and tasted vicariously. But I also hope that you learned a little bit about the history of London's East End and that you got a feeling of just how important these different waves of immigration coming together, melding together, have changed the food, not just here in London, but also, um, you know, dishes like fish and chips, which have since become famous, not just all over England, but all over the world. Uh, again, if you liked this tour and you want to leave me a gratuity, a tip, then you can do that at my PayPal link below. Please like this video, subscribe to Free Tourist by Foot, and most importantly, when you are in London next time, please book the food tour, come out with me on a Saturday morning, and let's go explore this area, get up close and personal, and you can actually taste all of these foods. So thank you guys, goodbye, bon appetit, and have a good day. Bye.